Welcome to Reign of Grace. This program is brought to you by Reign of Grace Media Ministries, an outreach ministry of Eager Avenue Grace Church in Albany, Georgia. It is our pleasure and privilege to present to you the gospel message of the sovereign grace and glory of God in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that today's program will be a blessing to you. Thank you for listening, and now for today's program. I'd like to welcome you to our program today. I'm glad you could join us. And if you'd like to follow along in your Bibles as I preach the, this message, I'll be going back to the Old Testament, to the book of Job. And the chapter is Job 25. It's one of the shortest chapters in the Bible, just six verses. And the title of the message is How Man is Justified with God. How Man is Justified with God. Now, you know, the book of Job is a very, very interesting book. And a lot of people, uh, when they think about Job, uh, obviously we think about suffering because Job suffered in a great way, uh, as much as probably any human being can suffer. He lost his, uh, his home, his, his family, he lost his wealth, he lost his health, lost everything that um, we by nature hold dear in this life. <clears throat> and of course, I'm not gonna go back into all of the uh, dealings with how God dealt with Job other than to tell you that he was, Job was, a righteous servant of God. Uh, and that means this. That means that Job was a sinner saved by grace. <clears throat> Job's position. He was, in the book of Job chapter 1, he, he's described by the Lord as being perfect and upright. Now, perfect means that he was right with God. doesn't mean that he was a perfect man. In fact, if you read the book, you'll see that, that Job... Uh, uh, sinned greatly in his pride and in, in defending himself in uh, uh, getting to a point where he claimed that he didn't deserve what he got but Job was a sinner and that's the way we all are we're sinners we're sinners in this world and if we're saved if we're right with God if we're perfect it's based upon the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ and not our own works or our own choices and then Job is described as an upright person. That means he stood upright. He did what was right. And what that means is that he was a believer. He was regenerated and converted by the Holy Spirit to look to Christ as Job saw him as the Redeemer who would come in the later days. Uh, the Messiah. That's how in the Old Testament they looked forward to the Messiah coming into the world to die for their sins, that's what believers did, and to make them righteous in God's sight by the work that he would do. And that's Job being upright. He was a man of faith. He was a man of integrity. He wasn't saved by his works now. And he, it, it, salvation is by grace. And that holds true for Job as it does for any sinner who is saved. But this book, as Job began to suffer for, the, for reasons that God unfolds as you go through the book, he had three friends who came and tried to comfort him. And they were unbelievers. They didn't know the gospel. They thought like we all think naturally. And, uh, you know, you see somebody who's suffering or whatever, and there's a natural tendency in us. And we, sometimes we try to curb it. But we wonder, well, now what did this person do to get him or herself in this shape? What, what's happened here? And, and that's what Job's three friends were trying to figure out with him. Uh, Job, why are you suffering like this? Why, you must have done something really bad to uh, bring this down upon you or God wouldn't do this, you see. So we've got to find what's wrong and then we've got to remedy it. And Job began to justify himself. Now, uh, that's, that's a problem. Uh, we have to understand, and this is something that we don't understand by nature, that whatever we have that's good is a gift that we don't deserve and don't earn. And so 
think in those terms. Well, one of Job's friends was, uh, was named Bildad. He was a Shuhite, and that was his nationality. And in chapter 25 of the book of Job, here's what Bildad the Shuhite says. As they're arguing and fussing and discussing and, and uh, philosophizing and trying to figure all these things out, uh, Bildad asks some good questions here. In fact, it's the central issue of the gospel, and only the gospel of God's grace in Christ can answer this. And it says, look at verse 1 of Job 25. It says, Then answered, then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, Dominion and fear are with him, that is, with God. He maketh peace in his high places. God is the God of peace unto his people. Verse 3 says, Is there any number of his armies? In other words, uh, God is, uh, Isaiah called him the l l Lord of Sabaoth, which means the Lord of a great army. And what that indicates is that God cannot be defeated. He's invincible. And so he says in verse 4, now here's where the question, uh, uh, well, in verse 3 he says, <clears throat> Is there any number of his armies and upon whom doth not his light arise? God is omniscient. But now here comes the question, number, uh, verse 4. How then can man be justified with God? How can a human being, a sinful human being... Now, now what Bildad is asking here is how can a sinful man... Now, how do you know he's talking about sinful men? Well, first of all, all men are sinful. All men and women, all humankind fell in Adam into sin and death. The Bible teaches us this. And the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So when we're referring to man here, we have to look at it as a fallen, sinful men and women who, who are unrighteous uh, by, by their works, who cannot save themselves. And the proof of it is the next line in verse 4. He says, or how can he be clean that is born of woman? Born of a woman. In other words, we're born sinful. Now, I know people talk about, well, we're born innocent and we go to the age of accountability. But that's another discussion and, and that's really not what the Bible teaches. We're born in sin. The psalmist recognized that. In sin did my mother conceive me. And that's not just talking about the sexual act. That's talking about the state of, of human beings by nature, by natural generation as fallen in Adam ruined by the fall, and as born spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. We have physical life when we're born. We have physical eyes, physical ears, but we don't have spiritual life. We are spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. That's why the Lord said we must be born again. We must be born again. So he says in verse 5, Bildad says this, he says, Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. Now, what he's referring to there is, is in a metaphorical way, he's showing that God is so holy and righteous and just. He's holier, uh, he, he, he's pure, that he cannot even uh, uh, look upon sin. God must punish sin. The heavens are not pure in his sight. So he says in verse 6, how much less man that is a worm. Now, we don't like to use language like that, but that's, that's what the Bible says. Man that is a worm and the son of man which is a worm. Now, that verse there takes some interpretation if we use the right rules of interpretation. First of all, you've got to recognize that the, the, there's two words for worm here. The first one that refers to sinful human beings is the word we would use for maggot today. I know that's not pleasant to think about, and it might offend your sensibilities, but it's just true. He's using metaphorical language to describe how sinful we are, like wriggling maggots. Now, the second word worm there in verse 6 is a worm that is used for... Uh, uh, the red color, the red dye, there was a worm. It was an actual worm called the tola. And it was a worm that they used. They, they uh, 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 squeezed it and got the blood out and used it for red dye to dye clothing with. 
Uh, it was used, uh, the re all the red in the tabernacle was made from this tola. It's the same word that Isaiah used in Isaiah 1, 18 when he said, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be uh, uh, white as snow, though they be red like crimson. That word crimson is the same word translated worm here in the second part of verse 6. They shall be as wool. And I believe the reference here, the son of man, uh, which is the worm there, is a, an indirect reference to Christ who shed his blood as the payment for all our sins. In the Messianic Psalm of Psalm uh, uh, 22, he, uh, Christ, uh, prophetically, David speaking, but he's speaking in, in terms of Christ prophetically, where he says, I am a worm and no man. Well, it's this word tola. So what it's saying there is how much less man that is a worm and the son of man which is a worm. In other words, there's a direct reference here that's teaching us that our salvation must come through redemption by blood. So go back to verse 4 now. How then can man be justified with God? How is that possible? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Now what he's talking about here is the justification of sinners. Uh, what Paul in Romans chapter 4 spoke of as the justification of the ungodly. God justifies the ungodly. That's how he saves sinners. You see, for sinners to be saved, there, there, there are two problems, two major problems that we as sinful people have. The first problem is a legal problem, a legal matter. And that, that means that by nature and by practice, we're guilty and deserving, we're, we're pronounced legally guilty of sin, and we're liable to the punishment that's due, which means death. We talk about it in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. That's what we've earned. Anytime preachers talk to you about something that you can earn or deserve from God, you better get away from them. The only thing we can earn or deserve is death the wages of sin. You say, well, what about my good works? Even our good works cannot be accepted before God apart from Christ and washed in His blood. So that legal problem, uh, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, there's none righteous. No, not one. And what that's talking about is how, how by nature and by practice, there is, there is no human being who is righteous in God's sight. We've got a legal problem. We're sinners and deserve nothing but death and hell. So then he says, how can a man be justified with God? Well, to be justified means this. It means, number one, to be forgiven of all my sins. Now, don't stop there now. Don't, don't, this is the problem today. You know, well, I, I'm forgiven of all my sins. No, to be justified is to be forgiven of all my sins on a just ground. In other words, wh on whatever ground God forgives me of my sins, it must be a righteous ground. Therefore, God doesn't forgive me based upon my works. God does not forgive me based even upon my faith. You know, these people that tell you all the time that God loves everybody and Christ died for everybody, but it does no good unless you choose Him. Let me tell you something. That is so unbiblical. God forgives, but He does it through His grace based upon the righteousness of His Son. So that legal problem has to be taken care of. Sins have to be paid for. Righteousness has to be established. That's the legal problem. Now the next problem, remember I said we had two problems. Number one is a legal problem. Number two is a spiritual problem. And the spiritual problem is how we are in, in this world, how we're born into this world, spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. And what that means is this. It means that we, we are in, in darkness, in ignorance, 
and even our wills and even our desires are against God and His way of salvation. If left to ourselves, we will not choose God. You see, this free willism that is so prevalent today, which says that you've got a spark of good or some kind of a good in you, that if you will just exercise that goodness and choose Christ, you can be saved. That is not biblical. It sounds good and it's popular. Multitudes believe it, but it's not biblical. The Bible speaks of the will of man uh, of, of being in bondage. In the book of Romans chapter 9, God says, It's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. The Bible speaks in John chapter 3 and verse 19 of the light that comes that men by nature hate because their deeds are evil. I quoted Romans 3.10 a while ago. There's none righteous, no, not one. If you go on through those verses, 11 and 12, it speaks of that there's, there's none uh, good, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God, no, not one. If God left us in our natural state and came down here and took a vote on how many would, would uh, choose Him, none of us would choose Him. That's why we must be born again. In John chapter 1, he spoke of those who received Christ, who were born not by the will of the flesh, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of God. So you see, we have, we're in a mess. That's what the Bible teaches, legally and spiritually. Legally, we don't have the righteousness that God requires to justify us, to forgive us of our sins, and spiritually, we don't have the desire to come to God, the true and living God. You know, when it says there's none, in Romans chapter 3, when it says there's none that seeketh after God, it does not say that there are none who, who seek after a God. Man is religious by nature, but his religion is an abomination in the sight of God. That's why not only must we be brought by God to faith in Christ, but we also must be brought, uh, brought to repentance of dead works because we're so proud of ourselves. We're so proud of our works and our efforts, our experiences. You talk to people today and they'll all, you know, about salvation, they always go back to their experience when they were young and walked an aisle and, as they say, gave their heart to Jesus and got baptized. Doesn't, doesn't matter what they believed, you know, they just had some notion that God loves them and if they do what they're supposed to do, They'll be saved, but that's not biblical. Well, go back to Job 25. How then, verse 4, how then can man be justified with God or how can he be clean that is born of woman? How is that possible? Well, that's what the gospel is all about. Paul wrote in Romans 1, 16 and 17, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Faith is necessary, folks. But it's not because we can muster it up within ourselves by our own free will. It's because it's the gift of God. And so everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and the Greek or the Gentile also, <clears throat> verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. Now what that means is those who are justified will live by looking to Christ. I've written a book called What is the Righteousness of God? You ought to order it. Get it. We send it to you free of charge. You can go to our website or you can call. We'll send it to you. And it, it, it's dealing with the heart of the gospel. The righteousness of God in Romans 1.17 <coughs> refers to the merits of the obedience unto death of the Lord Jesus Christ as the surety, the substitute, and the redeemer of God's elect. And it's through Christ, by the grace of God, that sinners, man, can be justified with God, can be forgiven of all their sins on a just ground. And what is that just ground? The blood of Christ. And be right with God. Have a right relationship with God. And what is the ground of that right relationship? The imputed righteousness of Christ. You hear me talk about that word imputed. All right? It's imputation. What is that? That's a legal term. <clears throat> it has to do with the, the, the demerit, the demerit 
of sin charged to Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it. Christ was made to be sin. How was he made to be sin? By a legal charge of the demerit, the debt of the sins of God's people whom, he, who, whom God gave to Christ before the foundation of the world. And who are they? How do you know who they are? Because they are brought to faith in Christ. They believe. And so that's, that's imputed sin to Christ. How can a man be justified with God? He's got to have a substitute. He can't do it himself. You see, I cannot make myself righteous in God's sight. I cannot wash away my sins. I cannot pay the debt. I can't even contribute to the payment of that debt. So I've got to have a surety. One who will take, the, uh, take my account, my sin debt, unto himself and say, charge it to me, I'll repay it. And that's imputed sin to Christ. But in return, and that's why Christ had to come and that's why he had to become a man. That's why he had to walk this earth as God-man and keep the law. That's why he had to suffer and bleed and die on Calvary's cross to pay the debt so that my sins are forgiven by God on a just ground. The blood of Christ, the tola here in verse 6. Son of man, which is orange. Red like crimson, they'll be white as snow. Christ washed my sins away. What does that mean? That means he paid the debt in full so that God does not charge me, impute sin to me. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Who can condemn me? It's Christ that died. Yea, rather, is risen again and is seated at the right hand of God, making intercession for me, pleading the merits of his blood. But now when Christ died as my surety, as my substitute, he paid the debt in full, he finished the work, so that when he went into the grave, he didn't stay there, he arose again the third day. Why? Because out of his death, out of that sin debt payment that he made, comes righteousness, which God has imputed to me, charged to me. I stand before God, not in my works, not in my choices. I stand before God in the righteousness of Christ, imputed, charged to me. That's how I have a right relationship with God. That's my legal standing before God. I stand before God in his righteousness. Uh, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. This is all my righteousness, you see? Christ, the Tola, he stood in my place, took my punishment, paid my debt, and gave me in return his righteousness. I have a right standing before God so that God cannot and will not charge me with my sins. I cannot be condemned. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Paul wrote in Romans 4, 6, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth righteousness without works. Quoting David in Psalm 32. But then out of his righteousness imputed to me comes life everlasting. Spiritual life in the new birth. That's, that's the spiritual problem. The, the basis and the ground of my uh, uh, new birth, my spiritual life, from which I derive life but from Christ through the Spirit in the new birth, whereby He gives me faith to believe, brings me to repentance of dead works, and keeps me continuing looking to Christ. The, the just ground of all that is His righteousness, His blood. And what He does is He shines that pure light into the souls of his people. He gives them eyes to see, ears to see. You remember what Christ said in John 3? He said, you must be born again or you cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't, the kingdom of heaven. You cannot see the glory of God in Christ. Without that new birth, the preaching of the gospel will be nothing to you. It'll be nothing to you. You won't want to hear it. That's why a lot of people, when we preach the gospel, they say, well, I don't want to hear what you say. I'm, I'm content in my religion. Well, what is your religion? If it's not the religion of grace, the Bible says in Romans 5, 21, that it, for as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness, not mine, but 
through righteousness unto eternal life, spiritual life, the new birth, living by faith in Christ, unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And so when this question comes up, you know, some scholars say that Job is the oldest book of the Bible as far as chronological time. And it may be. <clears throat> well, one preacher said, well, maybe this is the oldest question. Well, it is really. How then can a man be justified with God? That's the, that question was settled right after the fall when God took Adam and Eve and he removed their fig leaf apron clothing which represents the works of man, and he slew an animal, shed blood, and made them coats of skin. There's the, that's a picture. Genesis 3.21, you'll see that. That's a picture of the blood of Christ and his righteousness imputed to his people, from which they gain life. Life everlasting, spiritual life. The Spirit indwells them continually. He abides with them forever, and He will not be taken away. He will not go away. And He brings us to look to Christ. He brings a sinner to see his sins, that, he, that we deserve nothing but death and hell, based on our best efforts, even in our religion. And He brings us to see the glory of God in the face of Christ, to believe in Christ, to rest in Him, to submit to Him as our only righteousness before God, and to live in that truth, walking uh, after the Spirit and not after the flesh. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ who walk not after the flesh. That is, not, don't walk in their works of religion and morality thinking that that saves them, but walk after the Spirit, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And that's how a sinner is justified before God based upon Christ's righteousness imputed. And from that legal standing, that right standing, we gain uh, a spiritual life from above in the new birth. So I hope you'll join us next week for another message from God's Word. We are glad you could join us for another edition of Reign of Grace. This program is brought to you by Reign of Grace Media Ministries, an outreach ministry of Eager Avenue Grace Church in Albany, Georgia. To receive a copy of today's program or to learn more about Reign of Grace Media Ministries or Eager Avenue Grace Church, write us at 1102 Eager Drive, Albany, Georgia 31707. Contact us by phone at 229-432-432. 6969 or email us through our website at www.thelettererofgrace.com Thank you again for listening today and may the Lord be with you.